Stay tuned to PBS 39 for an all new episode of Focus as we showcase the people, places and issues that matter to you. We focus on community with a tour through the developments in Center City Allentown and learn about what's still to come on the waterfront. Customers are thanking us for being here. Then we go behind the scenes of the Roxy Theatre in Northampton. I made a my goal to completely restore the theater back to its original appearance as it would have been when it opened as the Roxy in 1933. These stories and local reaction to the Pope's visit to our region coming up right now on Focus. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest, Banking Insurance Investments, Fellowship Community, Continuing Care with Spirit, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laura McHugh. Since the opening of PPL Center in fall of 2014, thousands of visitors have rediscovered downtown Allentown, and many are working to make sure the investments carry over into the nearby neighborhoods. With a look at what's changed over the past year and what's still to come in the year ahead, here's Focus reporter Brittany Garzillo. Lara, Allentown's Neighborhood Improvement Zone, also known as the NIS, spans across downtown Allentown and the western side of the Lehigh River. Last year, we watched as the PPL Center took center stage in downtown developments. Recently, we checked in with a local restaurant to see how business is going so far and learn what's in store for the future of Allentown. In the last year, more than 550,000 people filled Allentown's PPL Center for Phantoms Hockey and events. It's another tequila sunrise. But perhaps the biggest show in town is the ongoing development happening just outside the arena. What do we got there, some fish tacos going out? Few have a better view than Donnie Petridis, owner of the Hamilton Kitchen and Bar located on the corner of 7th and Hamilton Street. Donnie opened the restaurant and bar in July of 2014. It's the first time that I've opened up a restaurant where actually customers are thanking us for being here. Serving seasonal American cuisine and craft cocktails, the Hamilton Kitchen and Bar is located on the first floor of Two City Center, across from the main entrance to the PPL Center. It was one of the first businesses to open up in the city's Neighborhood Improvement Zone, also known as the NIS, a special taxing district that allows for almost every state and local tax dollar a business generates within the zone to be redirected back into the NIS. Business has been great. You know, every month we see an increase. He says about 80% of the employees serving up these specialties live in Allentown. It's really everything from fried chicken to, to, to prime steaks, uh, shrimp and grits, uh, cheese curds. Jason Lonegro, the restaurant's general manager, has watched as Allentown's redevelopment has helped grow business. It's an amazing transition we've seen since we opened July of last year uh, till now. You know, people are coming down, now they're starting to investigate uh, Allentown. Allentown is a great city. We've gotten a lot of great support from not only people in, in the Allentown area, but the whole Lehigh Valley. People are really behind this project. People like Allentown resident Sarah Hailstone. So this is a map of the Neighborhood Improvement Zone. It is almost 130 acres. Sarah directs the Office of Community and Economic Development for the City of Allentown and serves as the Interim Director of the Neighborhood Improvement Zone Development Authority. I think that what the NIS has done for Allentown is other people now realize how much value there is in the city. Adding value to the city with PPL Center's 8,500-seat arena, various eateries, office spaces, and apartments. The booming business has brought approximately 3,000 jobs into the area, ranging from retail to hospitality and office. The creation of jobs. That is probably the most positive impact it's having here for us, 
is that it has brought, brought a mass of business into our core, which is really where we needed to rebuild. Don Bernhard, executive director of the Downtown Allentown Community Development Initiative, hopes to ensure that the neighborhoods next to the NIS rise with the developing downtown, with support from an effort called Upside Allentown. The goal is to revitalize the neighborhoods that surround the Central Business District. Don serves as co-chairman of Upside Allentown Steering Committee. Its $550,000 annual budget goes towards initiatives to improve the surrounding neighborhoods. We've set some things that we're going to measure that define what revitalization is. Increasing the income levels, increasing the, the quality of the housing, which you know involves rehabilitating housing, uh, investing in facades, encouraging more, more people to live there. Here comes uh -oh. Lehigh County Commissioner Jeff Brace purchased his Allentown home in 2007. On this day, he and his family enjoy the outdoors. What is it, Isaac? <laughs> Jeff serves on the board of Upside Allentown and as co-chair of its Physical Improvements Committee. What I want to see is a neighborhood where opportunity exists for the people who choose to call this home. Jeff says this year, Upside Allentown budgeted approximately $175,000 in facade improvements, including residential, storefront, and mixed-use projects. It, it's not an either-or proposition when we're talking about the strengths of neighborhoods, the strengths of business districts. Both have to be strong. That's the entire premise of, of living in a complete neighborhood. It's important that you make sure that as the, the center city rises, that the neighborhood rises with it. So what's to come? There is lots to come. And um, well, you'll see more businesses moving in. Uh, you'll also see some construction on the waterfront. Groundbreaking for infrastructure along Allentown's Lehigh Riverfront is expected to take place later this month. The waterfront project spans across 26 acres on the western side of the Lehigh River and will include six office buildings and five apartment complexes. And the most important thing is a better quality of life for the citizens in Allentown. As the Lehigh Valley Phantoms gear up for their second season and business blooms at city center, so does hope for lasting impacts for the people who call Allentown home. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzillo reporting. Thank you, Brittany. Later this month, construction crews will break ground at the waterfront. Joining me now is Zach Jandel, Chief Operations Officer for Jandel Enterprises and a principal on the waterfront. Thank you for joining us for Focus. Thank you for having me. For some of our viewers who may not be familiar with the waterfront, let's start with a true picture of what does it look like today. Of course. So the waterfront is actually the 26-acre site that was formerly occupied by the Lehigh Structural Steel Company out of Allentown, Pennsylvania, on the western banks of the Lehigh River. The site itself is actually bisected by the Tillman Street Bridge directly before it turns into Union Boulevard. And today the, the site is basically an underutilized industrial area. Uh, it's since been cleared for phase one of the demolition, but really it was a number of dilapidated buildings that sat underutilized on the uh, east side of Allentown for some years. And if your project does come to fruition, what will it look like in three to five years? So the waterfront's an extremely exciting project because it's not only a real estate development, it's really the catalyst for the development of the entire real, uh, Riverside District in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So what the, the project actually entails, it, it's six office buildings, all Class A, uh, range anywhere between four and eight stories. Uh, three residential apartment complexes comprising 433 residential units, 100,000 square feet of first floor retail between all of the buildings, as well as restaurant space on Waterfront Drive, which is the main throughway through the site, as well as the signature river walk, which look, uh, directly overlooks the Lehigh River. How quickly are we going to see action? Pretty quickly. Uh, so we're, we're starting demolition, or we started demolition last July, and we'll actually be groundbreaking on the infrastructure for the site, which really includes the road, the utilities, the plazas, etc. On October 22nd of this year, the buildings themselves are tenant-driven. So while we do have a number of tenants who are interested in a number of different buildings, we want to make sure that we're extremely responsible in the in the development of the site. So ultimately, you may be seeing the beginning of construction by the end of this year. And as far as tenants go, do you have any confirmed at this point? We do have a number of tenants who are interested and locked into the project. Uh, hopefully, we'll be making announcements in the upcoming week. Zach, what is the first step in the project? 
the first step, we, we will begin infrastructure on the 22nd. And then really what we're doing is we have a number of different buildings ranging in styles, heights, and uh, basically just uses at this point. Uh, we have a number of doctor firm or uh, uh, medical physicians f offices, physicians yeah. offices uh, basically interested in specific buildings, uh, different office tenants and others. So really what we're trying to do is lock in a portfolio of tenants for each individual building and then put them up respectively once they hit the 50% occupancy mark. What were the tools or the incentives that were put in place to make this possible? Of course. So the, the real tool that was used with, throughout all of Allentown was the Neighborhood Improvement Zone, which is a tax incentivized zone that allows you to utilize taxes on site to essentially give confidence to developers. The benefit of the neighborhood improvement zone is then passed on to the tenant in order to give incentive for tenants to come down into the city of Allentown. Um, it's a very vast tool that's being used, again, throughout the city, uh, very complicated, but really what it's doing is it's giving the developers the confidence to develop these underutilized areas while giving uh, tenants both outside the area and within the, uh, within the Lehigh Valley to help them expand and grow in their respective businesses. Over the next several months, we'll see American Parkway open, a bridge that is going to connect uh, Center City Allentown to the parts of Allentown on the other side of the Lehigh River. How does that play into your project? So the American Parkway is pretty critical to the development itself. Uh, really, the, the parkway itself was actually announced back in 1958. In the last few years, it actually underwent construction and is looking to be finalized in the fourth quarter of uh, this year. What that'll do is improve the access to the waterfront, uh, thereby allowing people to access the east side of Allentown a little bit easier, um, as well as the entire Riverside District, which is not only comprised of the waterfront development, which is the northern 26 acres of uh, the area, but also the Newweiler Brewery site, Bucky Boyle Park, and the America on Wheels Museum down near Hamilton Street. What do you envision this campus is going to look like and feel like, more importantly, when this project is complete? Sure. It's, it's extremely exciting. Um, what we're going to be able to witness is actually 2,900 jobs uh, inside the city of Allentown at the waterfront alone. Uh, right now, and deviating from the topic just a little bit, those 2,900 jobs in the full site build out will bring an additional $3.8 million annually in real estate tax revenue which is not absorbed by the Neighborhood Improvement Zone and can flow to the respective entities such as the uh, public infrastructure, public safety, or the public school uh, system in Allentown. So there's a number of uh, societal benefits that come with the development itself. But really when you look at the physical feel of the development, when you have the modern Class A buildings paired with the traditionalism of the uh, steel culture which is really fostered in uh, the city of Allentown as well as Bethlehem, you have this very dynamic and diverse area, mixed use, walkable campus that provides the urban amenities with suburban benefits. So you'll have the green space, you'll have the blue space, you'll have the walkable main street with the retailers and restaurants on the first floor, the apartments which is dramatically in demand in the Lehigh Valley, specifically for the millennials and the baby boomers, as well as the professionals who are looking to uh, minimize their overhead and rent but still grow their businesses. And how long has this project been in the works? Uh, the project in its current form, which I call phase three of the waterfront, uh, is really, it was a partnership between Dunn Twigger and Jandal Properties back in 2012. Um, we, we formed in January and by June had actually acquired the full 26 acres that does comprise the waterfront. Since then, we actually recruited our design development teams, uh, got final plan approval on phase one of the project, designed our entire master plan in order to maximize the use of the site, uh, underwent demolition last July, and uh, expanded our internal uh, leasing and construction teams. So we're, we've broken, we've cleared the site for uh, construction and you'll be seeing the groundbreaking later this month. So to answer your question in a nutshell, it's really only been three years since this project in its current form was announced. You'll keep us posted moving forward? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Of course. We now turn the focus to history. The Roxy Theater in Northampton has stood to the test of time. Here with a glimpse of this historic theater is Focus reporter Grover Silcox. Thank you, Laura. So many classic theaters like the Roxy have vanished, victims of the wrecking ball and modernization. Richard Wolf, the Roxy's owner, has spent the past 45 years restoring this treasure, making sure that everything from the curtains to the concessions reflect the theater's historic past. Even the way Richard and his staff operate the Roxy mirrors the original operation 82 years ago. Enter the Roxy and step back in time. I made up my goal to completely restore the theater back to its original appearance as it would have been when it opened as the Roxy in 1933. 
when you didn't think twice about the cost of admission. And that's $3? Well, here it's $3, all seats at all times. Never changes. A young man in formal attire takes your ticket. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The fellow who takes the tickets, which historically was always called the doorman, and he's in the period uniform. When people enter the theater, I'd like to give them a welcome and take their tickets. Good evening. And the man who owns the theater? Well, he's there, too, to welcome you. People come up and they shake my hand and they thank me and they say, we're so glad this place is here. I hope it stays here for a long time. In a modern multiplex theater, the price of popcorn can set you back up to $8, but not at the Roxy. The cost of our refreshments is literally, it's 70% off if you, from what you're paying anywhere else. In the golden age of movies, theater goers knew it was showtime when the lights dimmed and the curtains parted to reveal the screen. But we have a policy that almost all theaters did years ago. When you're finished with the pre-show, in the early days it was, you know, they would run a short, they'd run a newsreel and a cartoon, plus the trailers and then into the feature. But before the feature came, the curtain closes and reopens again to signify a change in the program that the main feature is gonna start, and we still do that. Folks flock to the Roxy as much for the theater experience as they do for the movie that's playing. As many times as I've come here, I always look around and see something different. This is a theater that has history, unlike so many others. A history that goes back to 1920, when Harry Hartman, a theater empresario, first opened this building as the Lyric Theater, which featured popular movies and live vaudeville acts. During the Depression, Clark and Greenberg Theaters of Philadelphia bought the Lyric, turned it into an Art Deco palace, and called it the Roxy after Samuel Rothafel, a.k.a. Roxy, who designed the famous Roxy Theater in New York City. In 1970, my partner, Paul Angstadt, and myself, who already had several other theaters at that time, uh, acquired the lease on the theater. The theater had grown shabby and worn through the 1960s, but Richard, who became the sole owner, was determined to restore its original luster. One of his first jobs was to get the marquee working. So we replaced the fuses and got everything running, relamped the marquee, and off it was. Richard refinished the wood floor, replaced the seats with 453 modern ones that fit the motif, laid down new carpeting, restored crown molding and ornate decor, rescued and installed a vintage Wurlitzer theater organ, and painted the walls in the Roxy's original olive color. Most of the decor is original, including the hanging light fixtures. The silk damask wall coverings are original from 1933. All the stenciling you see on the ceiling and the plasterwork is all original. In the 1970s and early 80s, Richard brought back a variety of live shows promoted by WSAN, a local radio station at the time. That proved to be very successful, and that helped bring business back to the theater. Many well-known performers played the Roxy, including Billy Joel. Sing This theater is the very first place that he ever headlined in a concert. Prior to here, he was an opening act. Today, the Roxy operates as a second-run theater featuring mostly family films. And although it appears as it did 83 years ago, it has replaced the old 35-millimeter films with state-of-the-art digital projection. Now that we're digital, Every show is like the first running of a film. It's perfect. Richard works tirelessly to keep this bit of history from fading into the past. It can't just be a job or you know, just a business. It, it's got to kind of be, it has, if it isn't initially, it has to grow into you. It has to become your blood. Well, thanks for coming. Very good. Thank good you. Good to see you again. That passion has kept the Roxy going for more than eight decades. That and the support of moviegoers who love a theater with as much or more personality as the people they've come to see on the silver screen. For Focus, I'm Grover Silcox reporting. Thank you, Grover. We keep the focus on history, and the papal visit few in this region will soon forget. As Pope Francis, the People's Pope, celebrated Mass on Benjamin Franklin Parkway in Philadelphia, the Diocese of Allentown hosted its own celebration of family. Faith opens a window 
to the presence and working of the Spirit. It shows us that, like happiness, holiness is always tied to little gestures. As the Pope spoke in Philadelphia, hundreds gathered to watch and listen in Bethlehem. Drawn to the Steel Stacks campus, not for arts as usual, but for a shared experience in faith. Approximately 2,000 people attended the day-long event. They contributed to a mosaic cross, played family games, attended performances from local choirs, and at the end of the day, they settled onto the grass or into their lawn chairs to experience this moment in history together. Joining me now is the Secretary for Catholic Life and Evangelization for the Diocese of Allentown, Mary Fran Hartigan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. For so many people who weren't able to either attend in person in Philadelphia or attend uh, this viewing party in Bethlehem, describe for us what the feeling was like. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> it was beyond anything that we, I think we could have imagined. Um, just a spectacular afternoon. And the diocese really wanted to offer something. We knew that not everyone was going to be able to go to Philadelphia to see it live. So uh, bringing everyone together as a diocesan family to view this was really our goal and our purpose. We were just closing on the world meeting of families. So this is all about family and to celebrate family. And that's really what this afternoon led us to do, to just appreciate and celebrate with joy our family. And it really reached beyond just the diocese. We wanted everyone to come, all people of faith, to join us. Having Pope Francis so close by in Philadelphia was really an historic event. And so it was just wonderful to gather together and celebrate this. Um, we are very grateful to Arts Quest to partner with us to make this happen. I think having this at Steel Stacks was just amazing venue for this. And we were so grateful to PPS 39 as well to be able to use the screen so we can all watch the Papal Mass together. What did the event include? It included more than just a viewing party. It did, it did. We started at noon with a Mass and Bishop Collins celebrated that Mass with all of us at Levitt Pavilion. So everyone was in the lawn area um, set up and very reverent, very respectful. It was really something to behold. And then at the close of Mass, all the festivities began. We had various parishes offered ethnic foods that we can share, so and celebrate our ethnicity that made up, you know, our parishes in the Lehigh Valley. We had games and activities for the children and just a real family event. I think what was what really struck a lot of us was how many young families came out. There were a lot with young children. You saw the, them pushing strollers. It was a real celebratory day. People were just joy-filled, which was just so exciting to see. What do you think made it such a success? I mean, there are sporting events that don't draw these kinds of <laughs> audiences. 2,000 people well. coming together with that sense of reverence watching. Yes. Um, I think a couple things come to my mind. Um, uh, first, there was a couple, a local couple, that actually was down to Philadelphia on, on Saturday, the day before, and they had tickets to go back down Sunday for the Papal Mass, and when they woke up in the morning, they were telling us that, you know, they said, you know, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna, let's just go to Steel Stacks and celebrate this and view this with our diocesan family. So I think that really resonated, the fact that People were coming together. We were all coming together, um, excited to have Pope Francis here and celebrate and watch the Mass together. And I think secondly, it's Pope Francis himself. I think he, he just exudes this sense of warmth and humility. He's humble and he's simple. And he had a very simple message for every, everyone. It was about love and mercy and how much God loves each of us. And that, I think, is touching people's hearts. It's resonating. Um, I was watching people during the viewing of the Papal Mass. Um, you could have heard it, like a pin drop. It was so, people were so intently watching this. Even though we were at Steel Stacks and this is happening live on the Parkway, I think through technology, 
it, we felt the experience of being on the parkway with everyone else and, and experiencing this and watching this together. So that just mm -hmm. fed into this. And Pope Francis, again, during his homily, very down to earth with some really great examples for family and family life. Um, his message, um, he gave these little examples of in a home, you come down in the morning and you go into the refrigerator and you take out your lunch bag that someone prepared for you and you go off to school or work. It's those little acts of love that permeate and make up a family. Uh, when husband and wife give that little peck of kiss as they walk out for work. So that, I think, is resonating with people. It's touching people's hearts. Finally, you actually were on Independence Mall yes. on Saturday, and you told me that you were uh, within uh, 30, was it, what did you say? It was 30, like 30 feet, feet yes. uh, of the Pope Mobile driving past. How will you remember that? Oh my gosh, what an amazing experience. It, you can hear the roar of the crowd as he was coming up in his Pope Mobile down the street. And yes, I was within eyesight distance and it was phenomenal. It was just phenomenal. People just were on fire. So it was exciting to be there. Thank you for sharing this experience. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Until then, remember to focus on what matters.